<laughs> oh dear, the fun we have. Anyway, yeah, uh, okay. Uh, my name is Matt Dancona. I am an editor and partner at Tortoise, which is a slow media platform. Futures by Tortoise is a reboot of a 1920s and early 30s series called Today and Tomorrow, in which a massive collection of writers, artists, scientists and other subject experts talked about a particular topic, the state of it at that particular time, and then went on to predict what would happen in that area into the future. Well, Futures um, came to us as an idea from Max Saunders, who's an uh, English professor. Who spent about 10 years working on the original series and thought it would be an amazing idea to update it for the 21st century. So that was an exciting editorial challenge, was to seek out the best and the brightest uh, writers, uh, and not just the most established. We also want to uh, showcase new talent and to start off with uh, five launching uh, in the middle of next year, 2020, and keep going. And it can't just be one vision. We've got to have an inclusive, diverse set of visions. This is about changing the conversation. It's about creating the future we want. What, do you, what are you, some of your predictions? <laughs> I don't do predictions. <laughs> Help us bring futures to life. Pledge to fund the first five essays by five brilliant authors. Head to unbound.com slash books slash futures.
Um, good, e good evening, everybody. Um, my name's Merope Mills. I'm an editor here at Tortoise. Um, thank you for coming. Welcome to Tortoise. Welcome to our newsroom and welcome to a thinking if you haven't been to one before. Um, and if you haven't been to one before, I should explain what they are. Um, they're not a panel event. Um, it's a system of organised listening based loosely on a news conference of the kind that you would see at, you know, the BBC or the Guardian or the Times where numerous sort of tortoise colleagues worked before they worked here. And um, they, uh, they take sort of journalists and experts and, and debate an important topic of the day um, and hope from that that we might come up with some journalism that we can pursue. Um, for that reason, they work best when we hear from as many people in the room as possible. But we do have one rule, because it's not a panel event. It's no questions. And that's because we want to hear your point of view. We don't want you to hide behind a question. Um, we, your point of view helps us come to a better informed point of view for the journalism that we might do. A um, bit of housekeeping before we start. Please turn off your phones if you haven't already. Um, uh, I have to tell you that you're being filmed for the tortoise members who might be interested in the subject that couldn't make it here tonight. So these little cameras that move, these little cameras that move around and catch you on camera. Um, and uh, this little tortoise making her way across the screen is called Agatha. She's a timer. Uh, she goes for an hour from left to right, uh, and at the end a little flag goes up. So please keep an eye on Agatha, and if you have something to say, stick your hand up, and I'll come to you. Say your name. Please don't leave it to the last minute like everyone always does. Um, uh, to that end, I'd love to uh, introduce our guests, uh, our experts who've invited, who, we've, who are joining us this evening. Um, uh, we've got Alan Hughes, who is from the UCL Institute of Cardiovascular Science. Uh, we've got George Leeson, who is the direct, director of the Institute of Population Aging from the University of Oxford. And Susan Saunders, who is the co-founder of the Age Well project and I believe in the audience somewhere we've got Dan Hegarty the founder of Habito uh, thank you for your support in putting this on this evening for those of you that don't know it Habito is an online mortgage broker and lender uh, on a mission to make people especially young people have a better experience of lending so uh, thank you very much for helping us tonight um, I would love to start with the first slide uh, which is a slide which is a graphic that you can find in your uh, little handy book of notes here and uh, it says that you can read it if you can. It's one in three children born in the UK today can expect to live until 100. Uh, and I'd just love to come to the room, if I may, first of all, and ask who here would like to live to 100? Quite a lot of people. Well, they're actually having just going to work a third. I'm going to say a third. Who here wouldn't like to live to 100? <laughs> misanthrop at the front. <laughs> uh, uh, about five or six of you. OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to you uh, again in a second. But um, slide two, um, uh, quite an interesting statistic. The average life, uh, the average person in the UK can expect 64.2 years of good health, but the life expectancy is 83 years for women and 79 for men. So you are talking about 20 years at the moment of less good health, which is why I'd love to come back to that in a minute. But Alan, am I right in thinking that we are living longer, is, but is our unhealthy end of life also getting longer, or is it staying the same? I think, if anything, it's probably getting shorter. But, but I need to qualify that by saying it depends an awful lot on where you stand in terms of income distribution and where you stand in terms of deprivation. So if you're someone that lives in the poorest, most disadvantaged 10%, in fact, your overall life expectancy is going down at the mm -hmm. moment. And your healthy life expectancy is going down even worse. So what we've seen over a long period of time, I guess George will know more about this, but it's actually a, an increase in the difference in terms of both healthy and total life expectancy between the most well-off and the poorest. Uh, I think that's something that should... So that sort of graph of that goes like that really paints only half the picture. Yes, you're showing the average yeah. person, I think. Um, it's interesting that that graph, if you look at it carefully, over the most recent five years, looks pretty flat. Mm. OK. So that... So the overall graph is like that, but most recently it's pretty flat. And in the US, life expectancy is actually going down. Again, it's pretty flat, but again, if you look at subgroups within the US, there are some quite disturbing trends. So if you look at people in the US 
in the age range between around sort of 35 to 45, then um, life expectancy is going down and going down quite dramatically. And um, part of that expl the explanation that's been proposed for that relates to opioid epidemic, mm -hmm. issues related to self-harm and destructive behavior, uh, and it's been termed by Deaton and Case, deaths of despair. So that's sort of a really big issue, I think, in the States. And I think they're just these sort of twitchings that something similar might be happening in the UK. Mm, OK. Um, but the, the, the sort of trend to live longer, <coughs> as we see as the average, even as a man of medicine, you sort of said to me on the phone that really only half of that could be put down to advances in medicine. Yes, and that's probably a favorable estimate, I think. Um, so most <coughs> of what we've seen in terms of improvements in life expectancy relates to social change. And which, by which you mean? So if we go back to the 19th century, we're talking about hygiene and sanitation. Um, that carries through the 20th century, improvements in housing, improvement in personal wealth, but also issues related to smoking. I mean, you know, the big driver of death, particularly in my area of expertise, cardiovascular disease, has been smoking. Smoking was an epidemic in the 20th century. It's also, I think, an under-acknowledged public health success because smoking has gone down from rates in the 1960s where 70, 80 percent of men were smoking. Now, most recent data suggests that around 17 percent of men smoke. That's a huge social change. And it's come about, in my view, as a result of policy. It's not a result of nudges. It's about banning advertising, imposing taxes, and more latterly, placing restrictions on where you can smoke. Oh, I guess journalists know that <laughs> quite well. Um, uh, George, I'd love to come to you next. Um, uh, you sort of intimated to me that you think half the problem is that we have a very 19th century understanding of what old age is these days. Very, we're very out of date in our understanding of old age. Yeah, I, th I think so. I mean, I, I think we've, we're all, we've already in the first whatever it is, I don't know how far the little tortoise has moved, five minutes or so, we've already touched them on so many exciting things, which I think uh, we can hopefully discuss in, in more detail over the evening. Um, but yeah, and I, if, if, if I could first of all pick up on one or two things that were mentioned by Alan, and you know, I think what we do really have to remember is that uh, it, it, it's very, <laughs> in a way, very misleading to look at population level data. Because if we look at population level data, despite some recent little hiccups, which you know, time will tell, as they say, whether or not that is a long-term trend. But despite those, as a population, look at those figures, we're actually aging quite well and living quite well. But there are, as Alan intimates, huge inequalities. You know, just moving across London, let alone moving from London up to Glasgow, the, 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 the changes in life expectancy according to the, the, the lottery of where you were born and where you live and into what circumstances you were born and you were it, 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 it's amazing how that does impact on, 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 on life expectancy and healthy life expectancy. I should also say, um, I, I was at a seminar just recently in Oxford and, 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 and I was really pleased to hear that there's good news for men as we move forward. Um, I, I, was, I was less happy to hear that it, it's more bad news for women in terms of healthy life expectancy. So that w it, the gains in life expectancy for men will be mainly healthy life years. That's, that's less true for women. That's something maybe we also, um, and, and Alan I'm sure has a lot to say about that. But yeah, I, the, the point that I made about, in a, in a sense, we, we, we're still living in the 19th century in terms of how we look at old age is, is, is based on the fact that you know, we have some social constructions around old age, and they are extremely difficult to break down. And one of those social constructions that's been around for over 100 years now is a social pension and, 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 and then retirement that came in. And they became synonymous with, that was it, end of story, leave the stage. 
and leave it to everybody else. Now, uh, if you think about when pension systems were introduced and retirement systems were introduced, it was actually a really good proper propaganda exercise because, so maybe, maybe everyone in this room knows, but when the first social pension was introduced in the UK, it was available to some people, not everybody, uh -huh. at age 70. This was at the beginning of the 20th century. Okay, Not many people reached the age of 70. <laughs> this was not going to bankrupt the country. <laughs> and the ones who did had a very short life expectancy ahead of them. Hmm. Now, what has happened since then? <laughs> Our pension age has gone down. That was at a time when life expectancy was at about 50 population level life expectancy. And now our life expectancies, as we see, are around 80. And yet the pension age has gone down. And it, 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 we, we seem to be locked into that perception that that means you're old. And I'm sure the vast majority, if not all, people that you talk to are, who are approaching or have just gone into retirement they don't think of themselves as old at all. On, on all, now, uh, we've got a medic in the room, so I'm gonna be a little careful, but I, th I think on, on almost all measures, you know, we are much younger for longer. And that those diseases of old age, the frailties that hit us, they hit us much later. That means that as individuals, we'd actually like to contribute contributing. They, not necessarily in the workplace, but in our families. You know, family care. Family carers are worth billions of pounds in this country. Billions, tens of billions of pounds in this country. Unrecognized, unacknowledged, disrespected. It's, it's unbelievable. But that is a way to contribute. Also voluntary work, the same sort of picture. And many do want to carry on working. Um, and in a way, what we've been looking at at the Institute and, 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 and trying to uh, put on the table in a way is that really we should begin to think about, just as it was 150 years ago, really, when pensions began to define old age, we should think about old age as that very short period of time before we die, when, we're, when we are frail, when we are dependent, and when we do need help. Up until that point, most of us are actually going to be okay and relatively healthy and active. And it does seem such a huge waste Thank you. for society to, to keep putting them into that box that of bracket. old age. Yeah. I'm going to come to you now, Susan, because that, that sort of notion of care, something, would you tell the room sort of what happened to you age 36, was it? Yeah, so age 36. I had a toddler and a newborn. I was working full time as a TV producer, husband, home, all those things. And my mum was diagnosed with severe dementia. So I had to add the job title of carer to all those other job titles I had. And at 36, I didn't have any friends who were going through the same thing. I didn't really have any idea. You know, I was I was busy potty training. I really had no idea kind of what I was taking on and, and how to deal with it at that stage. And what made it more poignant for me was that as a teenager, I'd watch my mum care for her mum. So I could kind of see this pattern emerging here, which I really didn't want to replicate. So I started reading and researching what I could do to reduce my risk of getting dementia um, and aging poorly. Uh, you know, I can never... You never remove the risk completely, but I discovered there's a lot, as you will know, a lot that you can do to reduce the risk. Um, and uh, so that led to a, a blog that I wrote for my friend Annabelle and a book, The Age Well Project, which is on here. Would you just hit us with three things you've done to make yourself live longer? Oh, three things I've got. <laughs> there are so many. There are almost 100 tips in the book. Um, and I always try and avoid the really obvious ones, like eat more vegetables, but actually you know, eating more green vegetables. Um, not, we were discussing this earlier, not being sedentary. Our lives are designed to keep us sedentary. And here we are. We've probably all been sitting all day. We're sitting again. Um, uh, and I, uh, I ask you to fidget. I fidget. I have learnt to fidget here. Just keeping, fidget. Yes, yes. Keeping, yeah, keeping moving. Um, 
one study found that uh, women they studied, but um, women who fidget a lot have no greater risk of mortality than very active women. So it's building movement into every hour of every day. I also try and get outside every day in daylight. It's such a, it's such a simple thing. And see a tree, that's my new thing, see a tree. <laughs> um, because <laughs> your green is really good for us. Being outside daylight is really good. So, you know, when you go out tomorrow, try and see a tree. Um, I'd love to come to the room right now, particularly those people who said they didn't want to live to 100 at the start. Um, at, and whether those people had a sort of similar experience to Susan or if there was another reason why they thought that they didn't want to live to 100 whether they've seen sort of experiences of, of bad old age. I'm looking at you, Jane, there's a lady over there with Would you say your name? I'm Mary. Hi, Mary. Thank you for sticking your hand up. I'm 64. My husband is 20 years older. Um, and the idea of living to 100 at my age is super fantastic. But consequently, because my husband is older, he is extremely fit, by the way. He's a writer, and he's just had another book published. So he's an amazing example for his age. But we were at a funeral yesterday. We were at a funeral about um, a month ago of people in their... Yesterday, he was 78. The other day, he was 79. And these are people for whom the end of life has been horrendous, really awful. They've been in homes. They've not had any quality of life whatsoever. We've got other friends who were incredibly active until probably they were 82 or so, then they had a fall, and the past seven years have been dreadful. So the key to me is how to live well until you're 100. Not only how do you live well physically, but how do you live well mentally? And those are the two things that I don't quite see the answer to. Um, I'm, an, I'm an optimist by nature, but I just feel that as I see people getting older, it all closes in, and it's quite, it's, it, end, the end of life is, you know, I was very lucky my mother died in her sleep. That is the most wonderful way you can die. But for a lot of people, it is not like that. So, I mean, it's, that's a question. It's quite interesting that you, um, that you talk about your husband being very fit and writing a book, because that, I, there's a the next maybe not the next slide but the one after that um, is 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 the the least talked about thing I think which is that how much dementia contributes to the end of life experience compared to something like cancer which has you know according to this booklet ten times the amount of of funding spent on it and keeping mentally active is something you know as you say everyone's got told to exercise more and eat veg but very rarely do we talk about staying mentally active and I think one of you mentioned that to me on yeah. the phone I think we talked about yes you met, yes, in, uh, intellectual engagement social engagement is probably as important as eating green vegetables and walking uh, if not more so and it is, it is that you know, staying engaged with life which obviously you're doing your husband's doing but it's, keep, you know, it's keeping up with that and not allowing that to slip but it's very hard when someone's had a fall and you know, that's not too far. Yeah, I, I, I can talk a little bit about the dementia point. And um, would you say your name as well? Was, my name is Jo. Jo. Um, uh, I, I watched a situation where my mother declined um, horrendously in terms of dementia. Um, and she was an extraordinary woman. She was one of the first um, women to get a first for NSC in economics. Um, and it was awful. It, it was a, a ghastly experience. Um, and. You wonder whether it's slightly genetic, because her sister's died recently, and she was slightly younger, and she's had the same, you know, yeah, end of life. I know, I, I know this in the research I did. So, you know, I'm worried personally, and, and for my sister as well, he's a bit older than me, but, but it's that point about quality of life. I, I think, you know, um, my, my personal view of it is that I want, I want my children to remember me as I am, and I'm currently, I'm realistically still grieving. She only really died about two years ago and I've, only, I've literally been dealing with the house and all the possessions and it's been fairly horrendous. And it takes time to get over it. And, and what's important for me now is to try and remember the mum I remember, not what I saw in the last four or five years. Um, so I think there's a whole load of stuff that's, that's, that's not well understood, partly about grieving, but also about 
you know, respecting people's wishes as well, because she knew what, she did know enough about what was happening to her. Um, and, you know, she was so utterly clear when there were divisions in the family over, you know, no intervention over any form of intervention if she had any stroke. And, you know, it's very difficult stuff, and I don't think we deal with it culturally <clears throat> in the West that, that easily, because we don't accept death very easily. So there's a whole load of social issues um, and, and cultural issues, I think, about how we deal with, with, with end of life in, in a way that respects people's wishes um, um, and also um, that there's more openness about those issues. Because people don't talk about it that much. You know? And, you know, everyone experiences it in their family somewhere, but it's a very you know, morbid topic and no one really wants to, to go there, right? You know, yes, it's kind of like, how can I forget it as quickly as possible and move on? Yeah, yeah. there's really no conversation about the impact on the rest of society of you know, that one, you know, that one person who has dementia. You know, they're the, you know, the stone in the pond, but the ripples spread a really long way and that's not ever really discussed or quantified. How do you put a price on that or economic impact? How do we address this sort of looming? I mean, you know, without it sounding too morbid, it, you know, you've both painted quite a sort of difficult and dark picture. And um, I think, Alan, you, you've said, I think the next slide talks about um, uh, the fact that, you know, we sort of, when we're in our 30s and late 40s, and I can see some people of, of that age here you kind of tend to put this, you just sort of think, this is really far away and I don't have to think about it. <laughs> and, and then it suddenly creeps up on you. And, 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 you know, hearing this, I personally think, God, how am I going to stop it? I mean, is it, is it stoppable? Or is it, you know, this is, this is just a fact of life of living longer? So I think it's not entirely stoppable, but it's at least partially stoppable. And certainly the observational data, so these are observational studies of large numbers of people. These are associations, so we can't be sure. But they suggest that it's really factors such as high blood pressure in midlife. By midlife, I mean sort of 30 to 50. That those are the things that are associated with an increased risk of dementia and cognitive decline later on. I guess that's... Factors in... in yeah. Things that happen to you so actually, to 50. If you look at, there is no relation. Take note, youngies. <laughs> yeah, no relationship <laughs> between blood pressure and cognitive performance in older people, but it is there in younger people. Okay. So that suggests that the opportunity to improve outcomes may be there in people's 30s and 40s and may be much less as you get older. And so your opportunity to do something about it is probably you know, as early as possible. Yeah. These are d the disease, the sort of things we're talking about, like dementia, are essentially diseases of midlife which present in old age. Mm. It takes 20 years or so for the symptoms to, to come through. So, so, yeah, so you're not off the hook because you're 40 or 30 or whatever. You know, it's, it, that is the time start the work. And it's also, consequently, it's very difficult to study. Because looking at something that has a latency, a lag between the exposure and the outcome of maybe 20, 30, 40 years, makes it incredibly difficult. Yeah. But I, I, was, I, was, I was hearing as well just recently that 30% of dementia cases are preventable. 30%? Just by our lifestyles. Now, this is not my data, but uh, this, is, this is what I heard. So I, you know, I think it's like many other things that we personally can do a lot of things to prevent, prevent uh, diseases like dementia hitting us. And, and we're, I, my understanding as well is that we're only just beginning to understand about dementia. And, and, and actually, uh, the risk of getting dementia is going down in this country. Okay. But, we're, but we're, seeing, uh, we're seeing a large increase in the number of people with dementia simply because there are so many people moving forward in this. And if I may, just before, and I'll then hand over so the lady at the back there can say that. It, it, you know, talking about death and dying is really important, and we are not good at it. And we are, we are approaching a time in the next 30, 40 years where we are going to drown in death. There are going to be so many people dying simply because we've got huge cohorts coming through, living long lives, and they're all going to have to die. 
<laughs> and, and, and so and, jolly. <laughs> I'm an optimist, um, but I, and I don't. But I don't think we should confuse our potential for living long, healthy, active lives, which I sincerely believe we have. I don't think we should uh, confuse that with a life where we're going to spend even more time demented, incontinent, bedridden, and whatever. I, you know, I, th I think if, you were, uh, if you'd ask the question, who would like to live 100 years of really active, healthy life? Everyone and would say probably, yes to that. And then people would probably say yes. And again, it's a but is that a reality? Um, it is for some people. Yeah. It is for some people. And I think what we will see increasingly moving forward I mean, I, I don't know, let's, let, uh, again, when did, when did we last see lots of people, uh, call, the cause of death on their death certificate? When did we last see old age? Mm. It's gone out of fashion. <laughs> but it's coming back because <laughs> actually people, people are in increasing numbers reaching the age where they die from old age. They're not ill, but their body just collapses and gives up. I've got to go to these two very keen hands I'm over sorry. here. The lady at the front, and then... I'm Joss. Hello. Hi, Joss. Happy to be here. Um, Thank you for coming. To say, uh, firstly, I did put my hand up to say I'd like to be 100. Uh, I'd live to be 100, not 100 now, obviously. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's actually unlikely because I have a health condition that probably means that's not going to happen. So, you know, you've got to take that on the chin. My father is 97 and is very active and has very... Uh, I mean, he's just getting old, basically. My mother is 91 and she's um, getting more foggy brain, should we say, so I've noticed quite... And her GP... Oh, what he brained is foggy brain. Being foggy Sorry. Brain. It's been really bad responding <laughs> to our concerns about her memory. He should have referred her on to a memory clinic and done all the things that I'm sure, you know, would have helped her. And he's just stuck his fingers in his ears and ignored that. So that's a, a, a worry. I don't know if you noticed on the BBC website that the latest figures about longevity, there has been a three-year drop in projected average length of, uh, uh, so, uh, in, in women. So, um, that came out on the BBC website this last week, I think. So, children born now, girls born now, it is projected that they will live three years less than girls born 20 years ago, or whatever. And if you're going to multiply, and that's since 2014, so if you multiply a three-year loss times five, you know, every five years, the way we're going, that could mean there's a 12-year chop <coughs> But I absolutely would go down the route of it's the last few years of quality of life. It is not necessarily about age reached. And there is a 20 year, no, there's a 40 year differential in Kensington, the richest borough, which also has the, the, some of the poorest people in there. So a homeless person in Kensington, of which there are unfortunately an increasing number, their life expectancy is something like 44, whereas a man in Kensington living in an affluent situation could expect to live to be 89. That's horrendous. Mm. And of course, that figure has become more and more profound because health inequalities are opening up. Mm. And the reason my parents are living until their 90s is because of the NHS, because my mum in particular has had interventions and my stepfather's still with us and he's 91. So three of my four parents are still with us, age 91, and that is largely because of the NHS, you know, and social care is in a pickle at the minute, and we need to rescue those services. If we want a quality of life, and it isn't just about medical intervention, I absolutely get that, you've got the preventative side as well, which we need additional investments in, social determinants of care need to be broadened out and invested in. And can I absolutely heartily recommend, I was totally privileged last week, to go to the premiere of Elizabeth is Missing with Glenda Jackson in, which is on Sunday evening on BBC. My lovely friend Andrea has written the screenplay. It's directed by Ashlyn Walsh. Plug, it, plug, plug. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. You can it have helps. a free pass. It helps. <laughs> Glenn's a place. You would, it would be better before you mentioned a friend, you see. Oh, I'm so know. sorry. I'm sorry about that. I should probably. Uh, yeah. Uh, but Glenda plays the most immaculate presentation of a woman with declining mental health, uh, mental um, capacity, with uh, 
Alzheimer's and basically it shows the impact on her family but it's also a murder mystery so it's <laughs> dramatising Elizabeth is missing, it's fabulous, watch it but, honestly <laughs> that, but can I just say there was a mention of intergenerational work in the booklet and the sure start model that has been kind of crumbled because my specialist area is children and families work um, the sure start model needs to be revived but also to introduce intergenerational projects because the benefit for older people having time with little people is, yes. is huge there you go yes. thank you uh, thank you Dr. Uh, Katie. Uh, i'm katie i'm one of the co-founders here at tortoise um, i have two sides to the sort of family story of uh, people that die young dad terrible side of the family not for that reason for other reasons but um, and then on my mother's side everyone lives forever so my grandmother is 100, my mother, uh, her, her father lived to 98, and my mother's 75, and none of them are showing any signs of giving up. Um, but we're very lucky, they have their health. Um, they are, um, but the thing that I would wanted to talk about was like, if you've got your health, and you've got a mild form of vascular dementia because you're 100, and let's be clear, that's not bad going. Um, the thing that I find really depressing is the quality of life piece, if you take those pieces out, right, which is the fact that I look at my grandmother now, she's 100, and unless there's cake on the menu, she probably would starve herself to death now, because she just lives in a home, she's moved in two years ago, and the big thing that changed was the concept of independence. And actually, for me, this sort of concept of assisted living that we sort of live with as a, as a construct that sort of is like you go into these places, it's assisted living. It sort of starts to talk about that decline in, in, in beyond health and mental um, capacity into a sort of place where you're left with fewer friends, you're sort of cut off, your quality of life. But the independence bit, the bit, the moment they took away her car and she couldn't get to go down the road, the moment they took away all of those things that gave her independence, um, you know, the fact that she'd been adult learner of the year at 92 uh, for Smithwick uh, in the Midlands. That's the thing that changed for her. And the thing I hope is that the concept of assisted living changes and that actually things like, I never learned to drive so that I will never miss driving, but maybe by that time, or I have a chauffeur, I can't afford one, but maybe. <laughs> but you know, the autonomous car, the, the intervention of technology, not just from a medical point of view, and some of the things that we've talked about in the health of people, but just that intervention in life where actually for my grandmother, if she had actually had access to a car for longer, if she had had access to all of those things that gave her her independence, I think she would have had a happier last two, three years that she's in at the moment. She'll die in her sleep, but she'll die because she stops eating, basically. Okay, I'll go to this one again. Sonara. Sonara, hi Sonara. Yeah, I, I have very similar thoughts about my grandmother, who's maybe 91, 92. Um, and she lived alone for a long time after her husband had died. And she's been quite strong physically, but she is getting memory loss and stuff, and now she's in a home. And I really did think, I hope you die before we have to do that, because you've been independent for so long, you're so proud, she's not very sociable, she's not going to find it fun hanging out with a bunch of people she doesn't know in a home. It's just she's not interested in that. She wants to be with her family. Um, yeah, and I, I don't think she does have a great family uh, quality of life. And she is pretty healthy. You know, if the doctors check her out, they say she's doing well. Um, so yeah, and she, and she has this phrase, which she said for years, maybe a decade, like, you know, I wish they'd just pull the plug. Like, oh. she really, and she really means that in a, in a long way. And she saw her husband have a lot of strokes and he was a very proud man and had more and more reduced independence. Um, so yeah, I think there's something about maybe being allowed to choose to, to not linger on and then something about how um, yeah, what do you, what do you, is, is there something a bit better than just being institutionalized? It seems like such a big gap between being totally de uh, dependent and then totally, totally independent and then totally dependent. Thank you, Sonora. And, and the lady here? Hi, Judith. So I'll, I'd like to give a just slightly different scenario. So my grandparents died in their 90s. They lived at home. They were fit, healthy. Um, well-educated, um, relatively affluent, and therefore were very likely to 
succeed in, in, in a long and, for them, luckily a healthy life. So they were independent right till the end, but all their friends were dead, all of them. And they were very lonely. Um, they, were, they had an incredibly strong social life before that, and they had no one left. One by one, they went to funeral after funeral. So the answer then would appear to be we put in systems that make the healthy choices, the easy choices, and you look at all the wider social determinants of health and everyone reaches, you know, increases their, ch and, and particularly working on reduction of wealth inequality across the population, and everyone is more likely to reach that age of 100 and compression of morbidity and all of that. But then I do think we have to think about the inequality of resource consumption across generations and um, what that means for uh, population um, in, within the UK but also global population. And is that something we should be doing? What do you mean by that? Just so well, if you look at, uh, so you look at the um, inequality of wealth distribution across generations now, I think one of your slides was about the average increase in... Uh, age of first time uh, home buyers. If you look at um, uh, who, can, who can afford to who can afford to buy a home, who can afford to live in London, who can afford to actually retire. Um, I think if you look at the distributions across well, I know that if you look at the distribution across generations, um, with triple lock benefits and pensions and so on and so forth we are disadvantaging the, the, the generations that are following us. And if you look at the global uh, uh, population growth, and you look at consumption of resources um, across the globe, sure, we, we're talking about climate change, we're talking about plastic, but actually, should we, 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 I think we should be thinking about uh, what, what population size the globe can take, and therefore, do we want to, and um, we also know that as populations get more affluent, so uh, child uh, family sizes decrease, um, as infant mortality decreases, families have smaller numbers of children. But I, I do think that we just need to be aware of growing inequalities amongst our, our generations, as well as um, working to uh, improve the, char the life chances of a healthy and a healthy long life for populations that already exist. Right, so it's about not just the inequalities, you know, within an age group, but between yes. age groups. Yeah. Yes, I think you're absolutely right. But were there any hands over here that I missed? Uh, yeah, Xavier, I work at Tortoise. Um, it's kind of coming to Katie's point and then uh, Judith's and your point over there. Um, I do think the social kind of fabric point is a really important one, I think. Um, you know, if, if you are just kind of friends with, you know, people of your age, when you get into your 90s, then, you know, there's an increasing chance that they're not going to be around anymore. And I think, um, I mean, certainly myself living, uh, you know, usually in the countryside, I think in the past 15 years, you've seen kind of, you know, a village which used to have kind of a bus route and used to have... Um, you know, a village hall, and used to have a pub, which was a community space, used to have a post office. You've seen these things disappear, and I think it's a really kind of under, um, a kind of underappreciated loss for, you know, lots of these places which tend to have aging populations that, you know, someone who, uh, even if they didn't have family nearby, got a lot of kind of social benefits from their community as they were getting older are kind of missing out on those benefits, you know, they're in a position where, you know, the bus only runs once a day, so they can't, you know, see their mates, or they can't do this, or they can't do this. So I do think, you know, if we're, the family thing is important, but failing that, I think, like, the community thing, which can really kind of hold people together across generations and keep people kind of happy and interested in life, I think is really important as well. Yeah, and that has a really clear impact on the health. People who live in areas with low social cohesion have shorter telomeres, you know, and the, you know, their, their DNA is, is, is falling apart quicker. So it's not just about sort of having a, a good time. It, it has a really profound effect on how we age as well. It goes beyond how you think. Hi. I'm Tina. Hi, Hi Tina. I was thinking about the model of care homes. I think that needs to change as well. 
I'm a creative, I'm in my 50s, I can imagine later on in life I'd love to live in a community space where we maybe rent a room or I don't know how but you know there's a whole community around me rather than a care home or just families. Mm -hmm. I think lots of people who are independent and now we see that people don't have the same job anymore all of their lives, they do lots of different things so we think very differently, we think much more laterally. Um, and I was actually, I, I went to a, a local library the other day, and I hadn't been to a local library for years, you know, having the internet and maybe going to a British library or something. And I was talking to the guy who worked there, and we were talking about it, and he said, you know, a lot of older people come there um, to just have contact. You know, there's a lack of connection, especially in London, I suppose, or in bigger cities. So um, that, that sort of got me thinking, I thought, oh my God, yeah, I, I don't think enough about that uh, because I know how to connect, maybe it is harder. But anyway, I think care homes really need changing. I think the idea of homes obviously fits something like dementia or something that's different, but I'm talking about when people cannot be independent anymore because they can't cook or something, it would be really lovely. I think they're doing something in Germany, um, yeah, they're experimenting with things like that, but I think uh, the whole care home system uh, could change. They have done experiments with students and, and students, you know, in, yes. living with older populations and in care homes in, in some parts of Europe, I think have been really and successful. And really so, yeah, successful yeah. what I understand. Yeah. Um, the gentleman at the back. Hi, uh, my name's Matt. Um, so I work, I'm a mental health practitioner, I work with young people mostly, so I'm kind of listening to all this, it's really super interesting, but it's like, I'm trying to think about it from the perspective of young people coming through. I think what you just said was really interesting about in London there's like a bit of a social disconnect and, and all the research we're using to inform our practice is basically that if you don't have good social connections, your quality of life is very poor. And then that's what you just said about your telomeres being shorter, it kind of adds oh. up. Like, and I think when we talk about living long and living well, it's, it's important to think about we're here living well because we can connect with people, but if you don't have the quality of, you know, there's no point living to 100 if your life is ruled by anxiety, you can't um, make those social connections in the first place, and then that would later impact if you even did it in a better care home. Could you make a connection with a new friend if all your friends around you are passing away? Um, yeah, I just think it's an interesting, it's definitely a conversation I think needs to happen a lot earlier, definitely at school level. The kids I'm working with have no concept of the fact that they one day will not be here and that these, these situations will happen to them. What kind of age are you talking about? That you so I work with mostly uh, sort of teenagers, basically. Um, but mostly the teenagers I work with, they're they're in sort of serious depression or anxiety because they can't, they don't have the skills to make social connections and all that kind of stuff. So you can draw a sort of parallel between the kind of kids that you're working with and the yeah, forced the quality, isolation of old age. Yeah, the quality of life is is basically it sounds quite similar, really. It's it's that kind of yeah social isolation, not able to to get what you need from other people and, and like we we're hearing at the front about the, the banks and going to the post office and stuff, they can't even do that. So it's like, yeah, I just think it's a conversation that would definitely, you know, it's really enlightening to hear all this stuff and I think for younger people to hear this, not hear it when you're 30, 40, it would be really interesting to hear it a lot earlier. Yeah. Um. Yeah, hi, I'm Mullen. Um, I think we, we talked a lot about living older and living well. You know, the other part of that to me is how do you pay for it? You know, I'm, I'm in my mid-50s. I'm one of the lucky people that has a defined benefit pension scheme. You know, these things that young people just look at or in awe at. My children are both defined, in the, but that, is that defined is, benefits. Is so, that, like you know, final salary. Final salary, yeah. yeah. Um, pension scheme. You know, young, young okay. people, <laughs> you know, they, they, they put their money in and their pension is a defined contribution. What you put in defines what you get out. Mm. You know, my children are both in their mid-20s. You know, if they're going to live to 100 and they're both pretty healthy and they may have a fair shot at it, you know, it's, it's about how do you fund that as well? Because I think Alan mentioned at the beginning, pensions came out originally. If you got one, you got it for a couple of years. You know, if, if, even if they work to sort of 70, they're looking at needing to put away enough money between now and then to be able to fund that, that, that post-work period for 30 years. I mean, that's, you know... When you're doing that off the money you've saved rather than a final salary thing, that's a very different world. 
I can hear you itching. Uh, I, I can I've been hear itching for it, ages. Itching to say I've been itching all my life. <laughs> <laughs> but, You're allowed um, to itch and fidget. It's okay. part of a... There are so many things there, and, 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 and it just shows how multifaceted all of this is. And I think every single comment that has been made is so, is so relevant. And, and where do you start? But let me start at the end. We're making the mistake that I tried to point out right at the beginning. If we're going to live to 100 and beyond, you ain't going to have the chance to retire at 70. And you shouldn't be retiring at 70 because every, everything is going to change. Everything is going to change. Just get out of the mindset that living to 100... OK, the first slide we saw was one in three girls in this country will live to 100. That's 100 years hence. Do we really think that everything else but our life expectancy and longevity is going to stay the same? Of course it isn't. Every, everything will change. And, and you're absolutely right. The maths don't add up, you know. And, 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 and this is why governments lie awake at night. Because <laughs> they, they know they're not going to be able to fund these pension schemes to the level of standard of living that, that people are accustomed to. No, governments will be able to keep people out of poverty, full stop. The rest is going to be up to us. So if, you ch if you've got a life of 110, 120 years and you choose to retire at 60, then, wow, that is, that's going to be tough unless you've put a lot of money away. Uh, but but, but and, and also, again, a lot of what we're saying, uh, and, and no disrespect meant, but a lot of what we're saying is, is locked in our inability to project you know, 50, 100 years hence from now. The fact that somebody who lives to great old age today and has a terrible death shouldn't mean that that's what will happen in the future. And can I just also point one thing out? Slight technical thing. Yes. OK. So during the First World War, the life expectancy of men in the UK, what do you think happened to that? It dropped. It plummeted. It went through the floor. What happened when the war ended? <laughs> Life expectancy went back to where it was, which is why, as a demographer, I'm, I'm, I'm a little wary, because I, I know how life expectancy is calculated. And I know that it says life expectancy at birth. And that's what we think it's telling us. But it, it's, not quite, it's not quite that. And so there, there are lots. So, you know, yes, we're having a little hiccup at the moment, but that may that may pass. Sorry, that sounds like to me exactly sorry, like the sunny afternoons of Brexit. <coughs> no, 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 no. It really, no, I, no, I, no, I, no, it's I, not I, because history tells. I, listen, I'm sorry. We have 168 what are you years. Doing? We have 168 years of data, which shows that our life expectancy at the population level has been increasing by 2.5 years every decade. But, but Mary makes a good point yep. that the, the, the sunny uplands is because we, you know, in the same conversation we've talked about, everyone's got to work longer, yep. and in exactly the same conversation, Katie mentioned, you know, self-driving cars, uh, uh, yep. uh, which would be both liberating for old people, but has been written about loads as a sort of you know loss of thousands and thousands of jobs. If we're if we're heading towards a world of greater automation and you know conversations that we've had it taught us about what jobs will survive, how's there going to be jobs for everyone? Brackets, do we all want to do them into our old age? That's my <laughs> other question. But we should, we should do because it's really good for our health. We should I, we should do yeah. we, yeah. we should do that. that um, I, I'm just going to go to Katie again and then and, and just a, just a small point on that retirement thing. One of our members mentioned to me that he takes retirement years every seven years what so so he so he's basically my age and he's already had three retirement years where he's basically said i'm going to be working so much longer i'm just going to take a year out every six to seven years and i'm going to enjoy doing the things that i that lots of people put off to their retirement mm -hmm. because i know i'm probably going to be working into my 70s and 80s so I think I'm just picking up on your point, which is I don't know what jobs we're all going to be doing in our 70s and 80s. That's not the thing. But just on the retiring idea, it, we, we have this construct in our head that we retire at the end of something. But maybe the concept of just adult years out for, for, for part of our sort of living better and enjoying life more and not putting off things until... Which is a lovely old. idea, but things like mortgages or whatever yeah, don't necessarily... You know, they don't necessarily... He's Work made like lots that. of different life choices as a result of that. He's not, he's not very wealthy, 
He doesn't live in London. He's, he's made lots of different life choices to, to, to do that type of life. OK, there were two hands here. Two people who hadn't spoken before, just before. There was, there was one hand there and one hand there, and then I'll come to you, this gentleman and then that lady. Uh, Michael, um, I think what George has said is, is, is spot on. Um, we need to rethink the the you know, like the, the, the way that our lives age and the way that we get older is based around you know some structures that have been there forever. Um, and you know the, the question about what jobs are we going to be doing when we're 17, and 18, it's actually what's the jobs we're going to be doing when we're 18, 20, 25. You know, that's you can't just deal with the, the question of, of work once we get old yeah. because you know we might need to do early retirement. You know, retirement. We might only ever work. 25 hours a week, you know, but we'll work 25 hours a week for, you know, till we're 90. You know, so I think it's a, it's it's the impact we're looking at as the old, as you know, an old Asian population, but actually we've got to think about you know, work as a, a in, in a new way. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. And the lady. My name's Donna, and I just wanted to add on to some of the comments on retirement, and I, again, I think spot on what George and some of the others were saying. But what I really believe is we need a fundamental shift in the culture and beliefs of the people. Because when I talked, I've worked with a lot of, um, I'll call them young people, but <laughs> they're both professionals. And I used to have a retail business, and I worked with a lot of 18 to 24-year-olds. And they believe that they're going to retire at 45 or 50. They don't know how. They don't know the values. They haven't done the numbers. And some of these are very smart. They're, for the most part, they were in uni or they graduated from uni. They don't know how. They haven't done the math, but I think this is now impacting retirement, and I take little dips into Facebook groups of job seekers in their 50s and beyond, and they're very frustrated. Um, they, the gatekeepers are in their 30s and 40s, and they're thinking, why should I hire this 55, 60, 65-year-old? Um, because they think, well, when I'm that age, I'm going to be living in Tahiti, so what's wrong with this person? And, and they're basing their criteria on... Um, sometimes fallacies of what a 55-year-old can do or a 65-year-old can do. So I think there's some real fundamental changes in the culture that need to take place in people's attitudes towards um, what a, an older person can do. And the lady here, yes. Hi, it's Jo. Um, I just wanted to come back to this point about generational funding because... You know, there is enormous inequality if you look at the ageing population on, on, in terms of burden on the younger population coming through. It's not just that lack of ability to buy a home, but it's also the fact that their national in, in, insurance payments are going to give them absolutely nothing, right? And they're talking to grandma and grandpa who had everything and, you know, signed on when they finished at 60 because they had another five years where they could get the... You know, it, it's, it's creating a, a social issue of, of generational tension which is really important to address with much more open dialogue. because And that, that dialogue isn't open, because the politicians are interested in targeting you know, the majority, right? and a lot of young people don't vote. That I'm thinking about this general election a little bit at the moment as well. But there's a massive issue about understanding about how we educate the younger generation about living well and older and what that means. I do believe, as, as, as you've stated, that there will be massive change. It's not going to stay static. But there's some real flaws in terms of our press coverage, how it's being dealt with, you know, and an inequality that's quite distinct, right? Because, I mean, I'm in a generation in my 50s. I've paid in 30-plus years of national insurance. I can't take anything out until I'm sick. And I'm not expecting that it's going to give me anything much at all. But for the guys coming through, it's more than diddly squat because it's all going to go on paying for the long-term care, the social care promises and all the rest of it. It's a it's, huge issue because they're the, partly the engine of the economy, right? You're going, going to pay for that, I'm afraid. The national insurance contributions are going to pay for so little. Exactly. The mass does not add up. The gentleman but no the politician will deal with that. <laughs> he does. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name's Henry. I've just got a really small point. I work in construction. There's a big problem with um, ageing workforce and skill shortage. Or, or like when people retire their skills kind of die, yeah. die with their retirement. Yeah. It would be quite nice if, if something got set up where you had kind of guys in the 60s, 70s who are like stonemasons helping young guys through their apprenticeships and things like that. 
I, I don't really know of anything like that. I haven't seen anything in London. Um, there are apprenticeships, but a lot of young people kind of turn their noses off at it because the pay's not great. But even if you kept older guys there longer, um, you know, until the 70s, 80s, doing like not manual jobs, but um, kind of light duties, it would help a lot, I think. It also depends, doesn't it, what sort of work people have done at a younger age as the impact on their bodies as to how healthy they are post 50 or whatever. Which you can't suggest that everybody has to keep working till 75 because if they've been in a, a, a area of work that's had a lot of damage on their, their you know, physical well-being, they're going to find that impossible and that then dives them into a really impoverished hole. So, there's got to be some kind of nuance in it. I'm just going to go to this, these two ladies here before Agatha uh, hi, raises Annalise. her flag. Um, I was just going to say, I think that's a great idea, and I think that we don't put that much value on older workers. Um, and I work in a technology company. Uh, the second one is kind of the older group. And I think we think a lot about diversity of gender and diversity of ethnicity. I don't think we think a lot about diversity of age. And I think um, in terms of you know, bringing lots of perspectives, um, having lots of perspectives around the table, I think that's really important. And I think it also um, talks to your health as well when you get older, because I think one of the things that keeps people kind of feeling younger is also feeling needed. Um, and I think um, my grandma is in her 90s, and one of the things she keeps saying to me is, I feel so useless. I just feel like I don't have anything to offer. And, um, I think giving people a sense that they there's still they have value um, to offer, I think it's really important as well. Sense of purpose. Yeah. Um, and maybe. Oh, mine's going to end it on money. <laughs> um, but going back to the money thing, I've just read in your booklet about the fact that we need to save £447,000 to be able to retire from the age of 65 to 100. And I'm not saying 65 is the age I would like to retire. And I'm probably sure that that would be the case anyway. But um, the government only, I think the minimum is now 8% with a joint contribution. But m my boyfriend, for example, has only just started his pension this year because the industry he worked in was a small company. They didn't offer a pension scheme, and he's older than me. So he's going to have to work until he's, I don't know, 100. <laughs> well, he's, only, he's only 28. But he like works in creative that they don't get paid great anyway, so he will literally be working forever. And I just think it's also forcing, or not the right word, but forcing companies to kind of realise that they need to make their staff contribute pensions, whether or not the company contributes themselves, but making that a necessity from day one of jobs so that there isn't this kind of fear of not being able to afford to live once you are unable to work that will happen in an industry. Thank you. Um, thank you all so much for your contributions. As you can see, the flag has come up, so it uh, falls to me to try and sum up some of the most interesting parts of the conversation, which is very hard because it was all fascinating. Um, but uh, I'd just like to thank those who brought those sort of very humbling personal stories to uh, the conversation at the start. Um, Mary, you know, you talked about, it's Mary, is that right? Yes, you, talk, you talked about your, you know, husband and, uh, you know, his friends and the, and, and the quality of life that they've had. And, and uh, Jo, uh, your mother, and, um, and Joss, I think you talked about the loneliness of your, par of your parents uh, around them, that they're healthy, but their, their friends have all died. And, and somebody said those words, it all closes in. And, you know, I found that all sort of very, um, kind of touching and a little bit frightening, I have to say. Um, uh, but from a personal perspective, um, that we talked about some of the things you can do to make uh, ageing easier. Um, uh, as important as eating veg, getting outside, seeing a tree, fidgeting, uh, is the intellectual and uh, social engagement that we obviously all need to keep up in old age. And I was really struck by um, your, your fact that 30% of uh, dementia cases are preventable, which is really interesting given those figures about what a drain uh, dementia is on, uh, on society in old age. Um, in fact, George, you talked about us rethinking our outlook completely to old age, which I think I'm going to try and do um, after this. Um, although I, I think 
think a kind of recurring theme, theme is that inequality is going to be is such an issue in, in, in this conversation and that we only really sort of touched on that a little bit, both inequality within sort of old age and also between generations, which I think, Judith, you, you talked to at one point, which I think is, is really important. And Matt, you mentioned how you work with a sort of young, younger generation who don't think ahead at all um, and uh, into this world. And um, you've talked about how in your 30s and 40s we've got to start thinking about that sort of life plan uh, now, given the changing nature of life expectancy. Um, I, I like your sunny up plans of Brexit that we're just living in a hiccup, <laughs> and, and this will all iron itself up, out. Um, uh, and I, I'm I, not I too keen on the Brexit. <laughs> 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 but but you know your optimistic outlook is a, is a is a is a a lovely way to end. Uh, and and sort of Katie's. Uh, friend, or no, it was a tortoise member, a wonderful tortoise member who takes a year out every six to seven years, and to think about sort of changing the way we live and work now with a view to um, how our old age would be really important, and keeping that sense of purpose throughout uh, is key. So thank you all for your contributions, especially to our experts, but to everyone uh, who came and said something. Thank you so much. It will really help us. Thank you.